Good afternoon. My name is Felicia Brundick. I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Thank you for attending today's webinar, a pollinator overview with Jennifer Hopwood. We are excited to bring you a lineup of master classes and webinars over the next few months based on feedback from our summer webinars. We are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Grow Native program this year in 2020. So thank you to all of our Grow Native sponsors for 2020 listed here on this slide. Uh, to find out more information about our sponsors, visit our newly designed website at grownative.org. Jennifer Hopwood, Senior, Pollina Senior Pollinator Conservation Specialist at Xerces Society, provides resources and training for pollinator and beneficial insect habitat management and restoration in a variety of landscapes. She oversees a team of four USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service partner biologists and works closely with the NRCS. Jennifer has authored a number of publications and articles and is co-author of several books, including Farming with Native Beneficial Insects, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees, and a Roadside Revegetation Manual. Jennifer holds a master's degree in entomology from the University of Kansas and has previously worked as a research specialist conducting invertebrate field research and identification and as an instructor in biology and environmental science prior, prior to joining Xerces in 2009. After the presentation, Jennifer will have time uh, to answer a few questions. So please type your questions in the chat below or the Q&A section, and we will address as many as we can. Um, if perhaps we don't get to them all, I will save the rest of the questions for Jennifer, and we will ask her via email later. All right, thank you. And now is uh, Jennifer Hopwood. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much, Missouri Prairie Foundation. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about pollinators. I'm from the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And we are um, a small nonprofit organization that has this broad mission of protecting invertebrates. Um, we have been around almost 50 years this year, and the main office is in Portland, Oregon. But we do have remote offices uh, around the United States. I did live in Missouri several years ago and am now based in Nebraska. And I mentioned we have this broad mission to protect invertebrates and it's broad because invertebrates are 95% of all animals and insects make up 80% of all species. So it's huge diversity out there. Um, and what's really interesting about insects is that we really tend to focus on the insects that cause harm, either damaging crops or as a nuisance or or transferring a disease, but those species are just a small fraction of the overall diversity that is insects. Less than 2% of insects are pests, and the rest are really essential to our food webs or really critical to our health. And just a, quick, a few quick examples of the roles that insects play. They're really important in recycling nutrients in terrestrial systems and aquatic systems, they help to control other insect populations, including um, agricultural pests, their food for animals. Uh, and the reason that we're here today is that they contribute significantly to plant pollination. Um, I'm hoping today that you come away with understanding the importance of pollinators and are more familiar with key groups of pollinators and um, feel comfortable with some different plant pollinator relationships. And then I'm going to end with a couple real broad steps to supporting pollinators. So how does pollination work? Um, pollination is the movement of pollen grains from the male portions of the flower, the anthers pictured here. And um, those, ant those pollen grains are moved to the female portions of the flower, the stigma. And when those pollen grains germinate, they transfer sperm directly to the ovary inside the flower and that fertilizes and becomes seeds and sometimes certain plants also create fruit around that seed to protect that seeds and help transfer those seeds and disperse. So pollination is super critical to the reproduction of many many flowering plants. Um, over 85 percent around the globe in fact rely on an animal to move pollen between flowers. 
And um, these animals aren't doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They are doing it because there's food involved. Like many, many animals, most animals, all animals, they're motivated by filling their stomach. Um, and flowers produce pollen that is chock full of proteins and vitamins and minerals that pollinators need to survive. And flowers, many flowers, also produce sugary nectar uh, that is a source of energy for these animals, primarily insects. And flowers also try to entice them in with really um, unique fragrances and with showy colors or designs to help those insects find those flowers. So pollinators are really critical for the perpetuation of flowering plants in ecosystems, and that alone is really important. But they also fit into food webs in a couple other ways. It's really critical. The fruits and seeds that are the result of pollination are food source for birds and animals, um, lots, of, lots of small mammals, for example. But pollinators are also directly a food source for wildlife. 89% um, of birds feed their young insects. Um, so they need plenty, plenty, plenty of, of caterpillars and other insects out there to feed their chicks. But it isn't just small animals too. It can be large animals that consume pollinators. Grizzly bears around this time of year, for example, will search out army cutworm moths and try to eat them quite a lot for their high fat content. Pollinators are really important to our health as well as to ecosystem health. Um, a good chunk of our crop production worldwide results from animal pollination and um, upwards of $20 billion of crops in the United States are the result of animal pollination. But probably most importantly, we would not be healthy without pollinators. Fruits and vegetables, seeds, nuts, the oils that come from seeds and nuts, um, other products that can be tied to pollination, those provide us with nutrients and vitamins like folic acid, vitamin C, um, nutrients that we couldn't get through other sources in our diet. So they're really critical to our health as well. And um, animals are, are the primary source of pollinators and um, the, the key groups of Animal pollinators are primarily insects, at least in Missouri and in most of North America. Um, the ruby-throated hummingbird is a visitor to flowers and might play a role in the pollination of some species, but these six groups of insects are the main pollinators. Butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, beetles, and bees. And I'm going to talk through each of these different groups and tell you a little bit about them. I'm going to start with the butterflies. Everybody is familiar with these beautiful, beautiful insects. Butterflies are often very, very showy and have patterns that can help them defend themselves or startle themselves against predators. And they also have quite long tongues and long legs. And one consequence of those long tongues and long legs is that when butterflies visit flowers to drink nectar, they don't always gather pollen on their bodies or come in contact with the pollen or stigma to transfer any pollen. So um, as pollinators go, butterflies are fairly unreliable, although they might play a role in pollination of certain plants. And the butterfly life cycle starts off with an egg, um, then the larval stage, also known as a caterpillar, feeds on vegetation. All of these different groups of pollinators that I'm going to run through today have these four life stages of egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And what's really interesting about these groups of pollinators is that their larvae often live very different places than the adult. So in the case of butterflies, caterpillars feed on vegetation, the leaves of, of plants, and different species specialize to different degrees on different host plants. So some butterflies have very picky tastes and only feed on the vegetation of a single species or a closely related group of species, while other butterflies feed on um, 100 different species of plants or more. Uh, the monarch butterfly, which is pictured here, um, its caterpillars only feed on 
milkweed species in the genus Asclepius or a several close milkweed relatives. And they can't survive on, other, on the leaves of other plants. So after butterflies consume this vegetation, they find a place to pupate and um, rearrange their body tissues inside a chrysalis, this beautiful metallic hard shell and then transform as an adult. And it's the adult that we see out on flowers, drinking nectar, flying around um, with their beautiful, beautiful colors. Butterflies can overwinter at any stage. Um, so it varies depending on the species of butterfly. Some might overwinter as an egg, while others like the monarch pictured here, overwinter as an adult. Of course, it doesn't overwinter as an adult in Missouri. It, it migrates um, south to Mexico to overwinter. Um, but those that do remain in Missouri for the winter time, which is most butterflies, um, will overwinter in their life stage under leaf litter, in the soil layer, or even under bark. And similar to butterflies, um, moths have a very long tongue and often long legs, but they often have quite a larger robust body and are long, have much more hairs on their body, quite a long hairs as well. Because they have this long, long tongue, the moths that do visit flowers are able to retrieve nectar from uh, flowers that have a deep, a deep corolla. One thing that I wanted to mention about moths is that most moths actually don't have functional mouth parts as adults, so you won't see them visiting flowers. Those species live just a few days and their main goal is to mate before they die. So um, there's just a few groups of moths that visit flowers, and those include tiger moths and the sphingid moths, like you, the one you see here, um, owlet moths, and a couple other groups. Just like butterflies, moths consume vegetation, host plants as caterpillars, and they have a wider range of host plants oftentimes than butterflies do. What's also unique about moths is they will eat not just the leaves, they will also eat the stems, the roots, the seeds in some cases. Um, so they'll consume more of the plant than butterflies might. Similarly to butterflies, they overwinter. Um, they can overwinter in different stages uh, and they are found in leaf litter when they overwinter in soil and under bark. Next up are the flies. And this is a flower fly pictured here. That's the key group of flies that you'll find on flowers. But there are also a couple other groups of um, parasitic flies that are found on flowers as adults. And those parasitoid flies as larvae feed internally on their host or, or on, on the body of their host before emerging as adults to feed on flowers. Most fly larvae that um, our pollinators are as, as adults, our predators. And what you see pictured here is the small body of a surfid fly. Um, for perspective, the surfid fly is chomping down on an aphid. So you can see that it's a, it, this surfid or flower fly larva is quite small, but it's able to pack a really mighty punch. These are really voracious predators and really important in um, controlling, contributing to crop pest control. They'll attack aphids and mealybugs and um, insect eggs, all sorts of different uh, herbivorous pests. And what might be starting to sound like a broken record, these insects overwinter in leaf litter and soil. Beetles are our next group of pollinators. Beetles will visit flowers to, as adults to consume pollen and nectar, but they can also consume flower parts too. So that makes them um, pollinators that can damage flowers in the process. Sometimes they're quite messy in their pollination. They're, it's just by chance and happenstance that they happen to get pollen grains on their body and move it around. Um, many groups of beetles are predators as larvae. Here you can see this is a soldier beetle larva and uh, attacking a bunch of different insect eggs. And over here, the adult uh, soldier beetle found on flowers consumes pollen and nectar. Some other groups are parasitic also um, on different animals. And they overwinter in grass clumps and the leaf litter and the soil layer and sometimes under bark or under wood. 
And then we have our wasps. Most wasps are solitary, so that's in contrast to paper wasps and to hornets and ball-faced um, ball hornets, for example. Most wasps live um, individually, so it's the female wasp that creates her nest and rears her young on her own. She doesn't have assistance from um, relatives or for others in her species. So that solitary, that solitary behavior means that these wasps aren't aggressive in defending their nests. They're not a threat to um, human health in the way that a large wasp colony of bald-faced hornets might be, for example. Uh, they're very gentle overall. And these solitary wasps feed on flowers as adults. The female uses that flower to power her energy, that sugar to power her energy to help her um, find and collect prey to feed her young. Uh, down here you can see a mason wasp who has captured a caterpillar. She'll take that back to her nest to feed her young, which are carnivorous, and feed on that, that prey and then emerge as an adult later that year or the following year. And solitary wasps nest in many similar locations as do bees, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Many nest underground. Um, or in above ground in cavities and stems, or they even sometimes build their own cavities above ground out of mud. Next up and last up are the bees. Uh, bees are considered to be one, the most important group of pollinators because they're particularly efficient in transferring pollen grains. And this is because out of the groups of pollinators that I've just mentioned, bees are the only ones to actively collect and transport pollen. So um, female bees construct and build their nest. And um, their goal is to collect enough pollen and a little bit of nectar to bring back to their nest to provide for their young. Um, hopefully you can see it under the little zoom window up here, but the um, female bees will leave their young a provision of pollen and nectar and then lay an egg inside a cell. Um, and because she makes so many, many trips between flowers to collect that food, there's a high rate of pollen transfer between flowers, which is really efficient. Uh, bees also can exhibit a behavior known as floral constancy. And this is just faithfulness to visiting a particular species of flower during a given foraging trip. So it just means that they fly in between aster blossoms rather than skipping between aster and goldenrod and then back to aster. And that again ensures that the aster pollen gets where, where it should go efficiently. Bees also, after they construct their nest, they forage in the area around their nest and that's a really um, constant and um, stable source of pollination for the flowers near that nest. <clears throat> and there's quite a huge diversity of um, bees native to North America, at least 5,000 species. There's 3,600 in the U.S. or probably many more that we haven't described yet, and including 500, 450, excuse me, in Missouri, and, and perhaps some new to science still to discover. And when we talk about um, bees, we can think about grouping them in many different ways. But one way in which I think about bees is based on their nesting biology. It helps to talk about what they need in order to nest um, and to talk about how to um, support them. So there's three main groups of nesting habitats that I'm going to touch on. Uh, there are ground nesting bees and this, these ground nesting bees are really most abundant in the United States, so at least 70% of species or approximately 70% nest underground. Uh, this means that each female will dig a tunnel and this tunnel will lead to cells and each cell will um, be where the female stores pollen and nectar as a food source and then lays an egg for her young. Um, some bees will also line the cell. You can see the inside of this cell is really nice and smooth and it's got a waxy coating that protects her young as that little bee develops from fluctuations in moisture, soil moisture. 
So bees really do their very best to provide for their young who they won't meet by providing a really safe nest. They try to find the best location that they can find in a safe place where they think their young will be successful. And for ground nesting bees, um, where they will choose to nest and what types of soil can vary between species. Some might build really shallow nests that are just a couple of centimeters, while others, especially those bees that nest in sandy soil, have the ability to dig much, much, much deeper to feet, several feet or more. The, another group of um, bees, according to their nesting habitat, are um, tunnel nesting bees. These are bees that nest above ground in pre-existing cavities or create their own tunnel by excavating a pithy stem like you can see here in a, ra a raspberry stem that's been excavated by this tiny carpenter bee. So these pre-existing tunnels might be a beetle borer hole in an, an old tree or a log. It could be within a brush pile. It could be a hollow stem from um, let's say cup plant or another species with a hollow stem. Could even be an old snail shell or a man-made crevice. All these bees that nest above ground can utilize different plant materials too. So some bees will use nest pieces in their nest construction to construct their cells around their young, or some might use petals or plant hairs to um, help construct their nests. And then the third group are bumblebees. And this group is pulled out because um, they're unique in several ways. These other two groups that I talked about are really dominated by species that are solitary so that these bees don't work cooperatively often, although of course there are many that, that do, <laughs> especially in the ground nesters, but most species are solitary. However, bumblebees are, are social, meaning that they build colonies and um, their colonies are annual. So they only last one growing season. They're founded by a queen in the spring. And that queen looks, she emerges after overwintering. She's already mated the previous fall. And that spring she seeks out an insulated cavity that already exists. So that could be an old rodent nest, it could be an old bird nest, it could be under a porch, under an old flower pot. When I lived in St. Louis, it was in the side of a brick building. Um, they're really very opportunistic and the thing that they're looking for is a warm place to build their nest. Because that queen bumblebee's job is to lay as many eggs as she can and to rear as many offspring as she can so that those offspring can go out and bring resources back to the colony and continue to grow the colony. So she really needs that warm spot that's safe in which to do that. And uh, bumblebees, although there's only 45 species in the United States, they're just absolutely critical pollinators and um, contribute significantly to wild plant pollination from trees to shrubs to wildflowers and also significantly to a variety of important agricultural crops. So um, I want to move into talking about a few specialized relationships just to really really provide an overview in those. And um, Mike Arduzer is giving a presentation next week with Missouri Prairie Foundation. So um, definitely check back in for more information and more details on all these amazing relationships that you can find in Missouri. The flower features really can in influence which insects visit and obtain floral resources from those flowers. So um, you can see here, this, this is a wild rose. It's got a beetle on it. And this is a silphium that has a monarch on it, mountain mint that has a scalated wasp visiting. All those flowers have really shallow nectaries, have pollen that's really accessible, or have a place to perch. And so that open structure means that any different type of pollinator can visit that plant and potentially um, access floral resources from that flower. But some other flowers are more complicated. Legumes, for example, have some special mechanisms and different petals that different pollinators have to negotiate in order to get to the floral resources. Um, sometimes they even have spring traps 
or plants might have tubular shapes like this penstemon here in which pollinators need to have a really long tongue or these spurs in this columbine again which you need a long tongue to negotiate so how flowers look can determine which pollinators visit them and certainly determines which of those flower visitors can be effective pollinators because although all these insects visit flowers they may not all transfer pollen adequately in the process for pollination. So some flowers do need certain pollinators. Um, they need a pollinators of a certain size and shape or to perform certain behaviors. In the case of this fringed orchid pictured here, they need a hawk moth or also known as the hummingbird moth that has that really robust body and that really long tongue so that um, as the hawk moth stretches its tongue into that spur where the nectar is located, it brushes up against the anthers and then the next time it inserts itself into the body, the um, floral, um, the floral structure, it brushes off the pollinia um, to where it needs to go within that orchid. So there are actually just a few key species of hawk moths. It's not all hawk moths that can be successful pollinators of prairie fringed orchids. It's just certain species because it's such a, a um, it's such a tight size that that flower needs in order to provide effective pollination. And pictured over here is bottle gentian. This is a flower that um, here in Nebraska is um, blooming now and it's got closed petals. And what uh, it needs is a pollinator that's strong enough to pry open those petals to wriggle its way down inside. Um, and it can be kind of a struggle, so um, it really, that needs to be a really strong pollinator. So brute force is what bottle gentians need, really. And bumblebees are the bees that are strong enough to get down inside to get the floral resources and help pollinate bottle gentians. And um, brute force comes along with milkweed sometimes as well. On the left pictured here is a fly that's got uh, at least three legs that are caught in the slits of these milkweed flowers. Milkweeds have their pollen packaged up in pollinia and those pollinia are really like little tiny saddlebags. You can actually see them hanging off of the legs of this wasp over here. And those saddlebags have to be pulled out of the flower and then inserted back into the slit of the flower in order for milkweeds to be pollinated. Uh, this poor fly has its legs stuck in the flower because it's not strong enough to pull out the pollinia. Um, just, just FYI, I did rescue the fly. I didn't, I didn't take a picture and then just leave it there. I took a picture and then I let it go. But um, other, other larger insects like this giant wasp over here are much more effective pollinators and milkweeds because they can get their leg into the slit and then pull it out um, while also pulling out the pollinia. Um, and then inserting it back in as needed. I mentioned that there are certain behaviors that certain flowers benefit from too, and one example is um, the behavior of sonication. And this is common in many wild bees. They are able to retrieve pollen and by um, vibrating their wing muscles to shake pollen from the flower. In some cases, these might be flowers in which the pollen is already pretty accessible, but they're just vibrating to speed up, shaking the pollen around so that it lands on their body and sticks to all the little tiny hairs on their body so that they can collect more at a time. But in some cases, like the high bush blueberry, which you see here with this bumblebee approaching, um, blueberries need sonication in order for their anthers to release pollen. So um, wild bees like bumblebees are really important for blueberry pollination. And um, that, that isn't necessarily as uh, important to sparkleberry, which is a close rel relative of blueberry. They have open flowers, more open flowers, and they can benefit from sol sonication, but they don't require it to the same extent that blueberries do. Sonication is really, or also known as buzz pollination, is um, important to a number of solanaceous species. So um, it can be important to, tomato pollination, for example, 
tomatoes have um, pollen that's packaged up inside the anthers rather than on the outside of the anthers. So it really needs to be vibrated in order to be released. And there are many varieties of tomatoes that don't require moving pollen between flowers. They can actually self just fine in order to produce fruit. But for those, there are other varieties that um, this buzz pollination can actually significantly change um, their production. So for the example shown here, sun gold, cherry tomatoes, buzz pollination can triple production. And just a really quick um, side note too, in greenhouses, some tomato growers have used a electric toothbrush to stimulate that buzz pollination action, that vibration that bumblebees provide to flowers to release the pollen. And somebody, some scientists did a taste test of toothbrush pollinated tomatoes versus bumblebee pollinated tomatoes. And lo and behold, there is a chemical reaction that takes place when bumblebees pollinate flowers um, versus toothbrushes. <laughs> and in blind taste tests, those tomatoes are more tasty according to, to that study. So I thought that was pretty cool. So in addition to some flowers needing certain pollinators, there are certain bees that need certain flowers. And um, what this means for bees are that there are about 40 to 50% of species um, that to varying degrees specialize on certain, the pollen of certain plants. So there are some bees that can only survive on the pollen from a single species or single genus of, of plants and some that have a broader specialization and visit um, flowers in the whole family. For example, the Asteraceae family holds, uh, hosts quite a number of bees that visit flowers only that are in that family. Um, while the genus Helianthus might host bees that have a much narrow range and only visit sunflowers. Some other flowers found in Missouri that Host specialist bees include vernonia and native thistles, willows, um, primroses, squash, and more. And these flowers can include some that you can grow in urban areas, in your own yard. Um, for example, planting squash, cultivated squash, whether it's pumpkins or zucchini, um, or butternut squash, um, plant it several years in a row and you're quite likely to have squash bees come to your yard. They'll nest in the ground underneath squash plants and they're pretty, pretty recognizable um, once, once it's time for those squash blossoms to open. And then over here pictured on this um, false sunflower is um, a bee in the genus Fastra, a sunflower bee that specializes on the pollen of um, sunflowers and silphiums and, and other asters. So what I want to end with is that if you want diverse, healthy plant communities, you really need a diversity of pollinators. There, there really is no one size fits all when it comes to a pollinator. There's no one species or one group of pollinators that can provide all the plant pollination needs. There's just too many, there's too much diversity out there for these plant pollinator relationships. And that extends beyond wild areas as well. In cropping systems, diversity of pollinators is really critical for stable pollination and quality crop pr production. Um, for example, in systems that um, had managed honeybees present, wild pollinators still provided an improved pollination. Um, they are particularly efficient in colder, windier weather. They interact with flowers such that they are much more efficient in some cases that manage honeybees. So having that diversity in, in agricultural systems is, uh, is critical as well. So um, what this means is that we need to su support this diversity of pollinators and we can do that by providing pollinators with food this means focusing on either protecting existing habitat or planting new habitat with um, native plants and particularly um, shrubs and trees and wildflowers that have overlapping bloom times so that you've got something available that blooms in the spring for early mergers like queen bumblebees 
and um, food available throughout the growing season all the way to the fall for queen bumblebees that are looking to stock up right now um, and build up their fat stores so they can overwinter successfully. And native plants in particular support greater numbers of species of pollinators, whether it's caterpillars, um, the larval stage, as well as adults, um, and also individuals. So abundance and diversity is just higher with native plants. Supporting pollinators also means um, protecting existing overwintering sites or creating opportunities for new nesting sites. That can mean for bees and solitary wasps leaving access to patches of ground in your yard. So it might mean not layering black plastic or um, minimizing your bark mulch. It can mean including um, bunch grasses so that there's clumps of grass for beetles and flies and butterflies and moths to overwinter in or brush piles or under logs or leaving leaf litter piled up in your garden or in a corner of your yard where all those groups can survive as well. And it can also mean leaving your stems in the spring, not cutting them back to the ground, leaving a, um, a stalk of maybe six to 12 or more inches available for those tunnel nesting bees and wasps to occupy. And then lastly, supporting pollinators can mean protecting them from pesticides, particularly insecticides, because insecticides are targeted um, not just to pests, they're often broad and attack and can harm pollinators as well. So these steps that you can take in your space or in your community, these are really crucial and directly beneficial to um, your space in that you will have more flowering plants and you have more produce in your garden and they bring you joy. That's, that's the take home message too. But um, they support broader biodiversity that's also really critical for um, the area beyond your space. For your community, it has broader conservation implications, especially as we are facing more pollinator declines and in the backdrop of larger declines of other insect groups too. And one last thing you can do to take action is to um, get involved in community science projects. Um, the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas just launched this past summer, and this is a, a project that um, in which anyone can get involved and track, help track bumblebee distributions across the state and help us learn more about um, where different species are and um, what their populations look like. So you can learn more at the website listed here. Um, the website for Xerces Society is www.xerces.org and we do have a number of resources that are available for download for free, um, plant, plant material resources, habitat installation guidance, just cool information about unpopular plants like thistles, which are amazing for pollinators and wildlife, but are um, a little bit maligned historically. Um, true also for milkweeds. And then um, lastly, I just want to end by saying thanks to Xerces supporters. We're a donor-based organization and um, our donors contribute directly to our conservation work, so it wouldn't be possible without them. And thank you again to Missouri Prairie Foundation. I just think the world of that organization and um, have really been privileged to work with them over the years. So I, I really appreciate your time today. And um, if I cannot get to your questions or you have additional questions down the road, you are always welcome to email me at the email address I include here. And I think that's it for me. I hope we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was excellent. I learned a ton and I'm sure everybody else did. We have a number of questions here. Um, I'm just going to start at the top here. Um, can you recommend any good books on solitary wasps? Um, yeah. I was turning around just to check if it was on my, web, uh, my bookshelf. Um, and I think it's in my other office or downstairs, but there's a book that I think is called Solitary Wasps by Kevin McNeil or Kevin O'Neill, excuse me. Um, that's a very comprehensive book. And I can just double check that title 
and get that to Felicia after after this. That's a good place to start. They're really pretty interesting. Great. All right. Uh, does the use of insect repellents on clothing or skin negatively impact pollinating insects? Um, nope, not directly because it's directly on your clothes or on your skin. Um, there's no reason that they would come in contact with that product. So there's no opportunity for it to cause them harm. All right. Um, how much pollen is enough? If bees have floral constancy, does having only a few flowers of one species discourage solitary bees? And is there an ideal minimum number of plants of one species? Yeah, there's a couple of components to that question that are just really great. Um, so if you've got, um, if you do have just a couple of flowers of one species, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there are tons of different bees that visit all sorts of different flowers. And so they will visit the resources from that flower and benefit from it. Uh, if you have a specialist bee and you only have a few flowers, that might limit the ability um, for that bee to produce, to gather enough pollen from your space. But bees are really excellent flyers. Um, although smaller bees don't travel as far as larger bees, they're able to navigate landscapes remarkably well and find floral sources amazingly well for animals with really tiny brains. They can have great olfactory skills and great eyesight. So they might be able to find flowers in your area that are compatible with what they need to. Um, but you mentioned flower constancy, and I just wanted to say that flower constancy is just more of a, a behavior that's exhibited while they're gathering pollen, and it doesn't hold necessarily to their whole lifestyle. It could just be a bumblebee concentrates on getting pollen or nectar from a particular species at a time, and that can be useful because she doesn't have to relearn how to get the floral resources from that flower and then relearn or learn how to get it from another flower. So once she figures out how to retrieve it from Liatris, for example, then she's just going to hit the Liatris because she's already learned that. So it's much more efficient for her to do it that way. So that's what we think is behind floral constancy. But, um, but, but to your larger point, um, and I've certainly done this in my yard where I've I kind of want to create more diversity and I kind of forget about the abundance component. It is good to have multiple plants of a particular species so that you, you yeah, so that you do have more to offer whenever possible. Thanks. That was a really excellent question. All right. Uh, that was from Val and Val has another question. Sonication helps to helps pollen to release seemingly downward, but how does the pollen get onto the stigma to accomplish pollination? Yeah, well, so in the, in blueberries, um, and I can flip back to it real quick. Um, in theory, um, this would be good right here. Um, the flower gets sonicated, the, the pollen will shake out onto the belly of the bee. Um, the next time it goes up to sonicate that flower, the pollen on the belly of the bee will contact the stigma sticking out right there. Um, so that's typically how it works. And that's kind of similar for tomatoes as well and other sonicated. It falls out onto the bee, the bee brushes it off the next time it contacts the flower. Because it does, sonication requires that the bee has to grip the flower and really come in close contact. It's not just drinking the nectar from the flower, it's hanging on to that flower and making lots of contact. So that's how that works. Okay, uh, can you uh, repeat the info on the taste of tomatoes in the pollination study you referred to when you were talking about sonication on tomatoes? Yeah, so um, I don't remember the citation, but I could certainly dig that up. Um, but the, the gist of the study was that they were looking at pollination in greenhouses of tomatoes and comparing um, taste of tomatoes that were pollinated via uh, electric toothbrush versus bumblebees and found that there are some chemical reactions that take place when um, bumblebees pollinate tomatoes that make those tomatoes tastier than the electric toothbrush pollinated tomatoes. 
And I don't know why that is. <laughs> um, but, and I don't think they know why that is. What pathway gets triggered to create different chemicals that apparently make the tomatoes tasty? That is an interesting mystery. All right, David asks, what are the pros and cons of constructing tube nests for solitary tunnel nesting bees versus just leaving dead vegetation on site or moving it to piles off site? Yep, excellent question. Um, the pros of retaining stems and natural sources of nesting material are that that mimics the density that you would find in a natural area. And that can be beneficial because um, those materials then decompose over time. There's new materials that become available naturally for bees and wasps to move into. That's one and two, um, that can limit the pathogen buildup and parasite buildup that can come when you have nest densities that are too high. So one downside of using artificial nesting sites is that if you have a huge block, and I'm not talking like a little bee block, but a larger bee block that's several feet by several feet, um, that can build up pathogens and parasites over time and can even potentially become a pollinator, a, a sink of populations of pollinators. Um, but the upsides of using small blocks um, to support, or blocks or tunnels or tubes to support um, solitary bees and wasps are that you get to see them live in action doing their thing. It's absolutely fascinating. It's a really critical um, educational tool. I think, you know, kids can get up close and look at them um, working. It's just really fantastic. Um, so those, that's a really important upside as well. All right, when is it safe to cut those stems left standing for bees? Yeah, so right now, um, and this isn't an excuse to avoid work in the fall, but you can leave stems up right now. You don't need to clear them out. Um, you can leave your flower heads on, that's great for birds. And then in the spring, usually, um, I, guess, I guess it depends on how warm it gets in Missouri, but if you have a warm up in April, for example, you can cut back your stems and cut them back, like I said, um, to six inches at the least, or maybe a foot um, in height. And then those stems will become nesting sites for bees and wasps, and then they just decompose on their own. So usually they're broken down by the end of the growing season. Bees have found other places to nest. And then you've got those old stems to use the following year. So, um, you don't have to do anything like, for example, right now is a perfect time to just leave the stems and leave your leaves and, and take a break um, and go for a hike instead of <laughs> gardening if you want to enjoy the outside. Uh, okay, Beverly asks, um, she said, I've read that leaving our dandelions in the lawns and beds is important for pollinators in the spring. Is there an educational push that can help people accept having dandelions and not viewing them as a pest that needs to be eradicated? Yeah, that's a great, a great point. Um, there are a couple city initiatives that involve trying to encourage people to um, reduce lawn, either by planting wildflowers or garden plants or by um, incorporating clovers or other dandelions too into lawns to support um, bees and, and other diversity, but also from the perspective of it saves water quite a lot. Lawn um, is a notorious water hog, so the less lawn you have, the better it is for water systems, plus it just water runs off, it doesn't filtrate and down into the soil, so um, diversifying and reducing lawn whenever possible is a really good thing. I don't know of any national initiative, um, but I think that's great. And I, I do hope that dandelions are a little bit more normalized than they used to be, but I do, I suspect that we have a long ways to go, just like with thistles. <laughs> Uh, Kathy said, how, how do you encourage a bee population that is active early enough for cherry, pear, and other fruit trees? Yeah, there are a number of wild species that emerge around that time, quite a few that will be active in, in fruit trees. Um, so there are some ground nesting bees that are called mining bees that are really, um, that 
their emergence time coincides with fruit tree bloom and they can be really active. Bumblebee queens can sometimes be found in orchards and fruit trees and um, small carpenter bees sometimes um, what's known as cellophane bees can be in pretty good abundance. There's just, um, bees can be quite diverse in orchards. So what you can do to support that is make sure you've got plants blooming before and after orchard. So that might mean supporting flowering shrubs that bloom really early like willows and um, other, other flowering shrubs and then some flowers that bloom a little bit after uh, because the flight time of all those species I just mentioned, um, while it coincides with fruit tree bloom, also overlaps before and after. And so fruit tree bloom is huge while it's blooming. It's a great resource, but you've got to have other things blooming around it in order to support pollinators on either side of it. Um, so that's one thing you can do to encourage them. And then also encouraging nesting sites. That's, a, that's another thing too that's really important. So you might already be doing these things too, probably. Um. All right. Um, I have a couple more here. What is the life expectancy of a queen bee? Uh, if you're talking about a queen bumblebee, it's one year. Um, if you're talking about a queen honeybee, which is an introduced managed species, it's usually three to four years. Those are perennial colonies. So they overwinter by storing a whole bunch of honey within their hive and um, trying to collectively use their heat to survive the, the cold temperatures in the winter. And that queen usually does live a couple years, but queen bumblebees um, only live one year. The new queens are out right now mating, eating lots of resources, and then they'll overwinter and start colonies next year. All right, uh, we have a question from Lisa and I'm reading it kind of kind of chuckling because it's a question that we have all the time. Um, the second part of the question, at least. Uh, gathering leaves in the fall and sending to a city dump, does this common suburban phenomenon rank number one as the reason we have decline in certain pollinators? In other euros, if neighborhoods can't stand having leaf litter, what other habitat coaxing and coaching can we do with those neighbors? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think Missouri Prairie Foundation has a really nice leave the leaves sign. Um, so that's one thing I might recommend. Um, that leaf litter, as you probably gathered, since you're asking this question, is super important for butterflies and moths and even queen bumblebees that overwinter, um, beetles and flies. Um, as an overwintering habitat, it's really important. So finding a way to keep it in your landscape is really valuable. And um, what you can do is you can kind of hide it away. You can tuck it under trees and shrubs. That's that's fine, you know, those insects will find it. They don't mind about aesthetics at all. So if aesthetics are really important to your neighbors, that's one thing you might consider, consider is just sort of tucking it away. You can pile it on your vegetable bed. If you've got a vegetable bed, you can pile it on your wildflower gardens. Um, those are some strategies. You don't have to, you know, worry about keeping all of it. If you have to compost or dump some of it, um, that might just be a compromise you have to make in order to slowly chip away at your neighbors and help them to understand that leaf litter is a part of and important to nature. And it's also really important to soil, really important to the health of the, the lawn really sometimes too. So I don't know, that's another public campaign that would be really good to launch. But I do think having signage in your yard can really help. Um, especially in climates like Missouri and Nebraska, where we have long cold periods and um, having a sign that indicates that your, your garden is a little bit more messy, but there's a real reason behind that can be really important. Yeah, and like Jennifer said, we do have those leave the leaves signs in our online store. It's uh, store.moprairie.org. Um, I believe, or you can find it on the moprairie.org website. Uh, we have plenty of those signs and I can ship them to you. Um, Brad said, I had to cut down two maples this spring and he left six to eight foot stumps. The area is now sunny and he's going to make it a pollinator garden. If he drills holes in the stumps, will the bees use them? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, um, I would suspect that they might, as it decomposes to 
Um, there will be lots of other insects that use it. Um, and probably if you had to cut down that old maple tree, there are probably existing beetle borer holes in it, or there might be in that stump soon. So you could certainly, I think it, you, you should, yeah, definitely give that a try and see what comes. But even if you leave it alone, it will be useful. All right, I think we have um, just one more question here. What is the flower on that last screen, the questions page? Oh, uh, yeah, I think that's mountain mint, Pennsylvania mountain mint. Um, uh, Pycnanthemum virginium. Yeah, it's just really close up. It's um, <laughs> just really, really, really close. Because <laughs> that's a very small male leaf cutter bee. All right. Oh, we do have one more that came in that's uh, pretty interesting here. Um, any recommendations on how to work with a city that sprays insecticides weekly for certain months of the year? Um, it's, it's on a weekly basis and has no request from community action to prevent mosquitoes. Okay. Um, we do have some guidance on our website about community action that citizens can take um, or that communities can take to um, interact with their city. So um, if you go to xerces.org and then um, I believe there's, there's some tabs in the upper right corner and you can scroll to find the one that's about reducing pesticides. Um, that should lead to some other information about um, guidance for communities looking to have conversations about mosquito management. Yeah, and there's some other resources there too that provide um, extensive background on mosquito management. So um, what types of mosquito management uh, is available and what's particularly ecologically sound. Um, so there are some resources through there. And then also I can connect you with our, um, with a, a person on staff who can answer more questions about that if you have them. All right. Uh, well, I think that's uh, about all the questions that we have. And um, if any more have come in that I've missed, um, I will address them tomorrow in my follow-up email to everyone. Uh, so look for that tomorrow afternoon. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for, uh, for speaking for us. This was wonderful. And um, we, we have a lot of people coming in saying, thank you, Jennifer. So uh, everybody have a great day. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.